Today on the Uniweb Interview Show, author of the weirdest movie ever made, Phil Hall. Woo! Yeah! Phil Hall, author of the weirdest movie ever. Thank you so much for joining me on Uniweb Interview Show. Well, thank you, but I should point out it's called The Weirdest Movie Ever Made. And there's also a subtitle to it called The Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot Film. It's a new book about an old film. Uh, if you ever see uh, any documentaries on Bigfoot and you see that grainy uh, footage of Bigfoot supposedly walking through the woods in California, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the Patterson Gimlin film. It was shot by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin back in October 1967. And here we are, 52 years later, still talking about that little 59 seconds of footage. I know, and they haven't found anything else besides that. It's What, what was it, because I read the synopsis and everything, I, I read the information you sent me, what was it that got you interested in wanting to write this book about this short little 59 second film? Well, I'm a film writer. I've done a number of books on the subject of filmmaking and film history. And I was starting to run out of ideas about what to do my eighth <laughs> book about. And I had submitted a list to my publisher at Bear Mountain Media. And I had an idea for a book called The 100 Movies That Changed the World. And it was going to be a collection of essays on films that had a significant impact on sociology, politics, culture, etc. And my publisher said, that's a terrible idea for a book. <laughs> he what? said, uh, "He said, go back and just pick one of the films, not a hundred, just one. Yeah. And I looked over the list of the hundred films that I had compiled, and I realized, you know, my publisher was right, because who wants to read another book about Citizen Kane or Gone with the Wind or The Godfather? And I was looking at the list, and I wanted to get a film that really hasn't been written about from a cinematic perspective. And on that list was the Patterson-Gimlin film, because this little 59 seconds of footage put Bigfoot into popular culture. And there have been books about Bigfoot, whether it's real, whether it's fake, but there hasn't been a book about the cinematic aspect of the footage, right. how it was done, and how it changed uh, so many things, too, not just the perception of the cryptozoological, but also how films get distributed, because in the course of the research, which I didn't realize, is how the uh, footage itself wound up in popular culture. Because when you stop and think of it, I mean, I'm, you may not realize looking at me, but I'm old enough to recall the 1970s, having been there. And Bigfoot was always there when I was a kid. If you turned on the TV or opened a magazine or even went to the movies, uh, Bigfoot was somewhere lurking about. So Bigfoot was always part of my generation's life. But I realized there had to be a time before Bigfoot got into the popular culture. How did this film become the phenomenon that it became? And doing the research, I discovered so much about how Roger Patterson was able to get the film out of the forest in California and into wide release. It was just completely mind-boggling to me. So it was a lot of fun to research the book. Yeah, so you you dig in pretty deep on not just the discovery of or the video, but like how it was made, what it, how it spread out across the world. I mean, I remember the the my first um, I guess intro into it was um, George and the Hendersons of the family. Remember, you know, what I'm talking about the movies. Harry, yeah, Harry, Harry and the Hendersons. Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah, yeah, and then I started because that was basically based off of the same that that 59 seconds, and it's crazy. Yeah. There's still there's like television shows going into the forest in the woods and in the mountains yeah. still to this day looking yeah. for Bigfoot. There's that series Finding Bigfoot, which I think Find should be not Finding Bigfoot because they actually never <laughs> they never find Bigfoot. They, we can look looking at the trees. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they run around these forests and they, they never actually come up with evidence. But this has been going on for what five or six seasons now, and it's uh, yeah. more power to them. It's amazing that people. Yeah, I mean. Looking at bent over trees is pretty exciting stuff. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> but the thing is, it's like the, at, before this video and after this video, there really has not been any other footage comparable to it. Is that correct? Well, I have to correct you on something. It, it wasn't a video. This was 1967, so okay. uh, right. they were working with a 16 millimeter camera, and that's actually part of the controversy okay. with this because uh, they had to go have this film developed. 
And there had been some discrepancies as to just where it was developed because Patterson and Gimlin would claim they couldn't remember which lab it was in, but it didn't make much sense because of the timeline of when it was shot and how they got the film back to Washington State where they lived to have it processed. Uh, you know, it's funny because in today's uh, video age, you'd think we would just pick up a phone and you can uh, make a viral video happen, one, two, three. But back in 1967, they didn't have that luxury. And most people actually didn't get to see the film itself until about 10 years after it was shot. Wow. Yeah, just the idea of some guys sitting out there with a, would you say, 16 millimeter uh, camera in the woods set up at the exact right time. And now everyone's got a camera on them and we still haven't caught anything. Um, so what are you hoping to uh, uncover or, or what, what's the what's the mission for this this book? Is it just to tell a story? Are you looking to inform or? I'm looking to inform. I'm looking to entertain because, uh, as I said, the people of my generation who grew up with Bigfoot there, when I told them that I was writing this book, everybody started smiling and, and laughing because you, you can't speak about Bigfoot without uh, having a good feeling about it. Nobody gets angry about Bigfoot the way you'd get angry talking about politics today. But if, <laughs> yes. if, you, were to say, if you were to say Bigfoot, uh, then it's like, oh yeah, oh, this is fun. And, it's, and when I was telling people I was writing this book, it's like, I can't wait to see this. This, this is gonna be fun. And it's just hilarious because even at this late date, 52 years after the Patterson Gimlin film was shot, people are still claiming that they're running into Bigfoot. And the book itself has a series of uh, like little news briefs from today where various people claim that they've seen Bigfoot in very strange ways. There was one woman out in, I think it was Montana or Idaho, one of the states up there, who claimed that Bigfoot chased a deer across the highway and the deer ran into her car. So. Uh, the, the, state, hey, Bigfoot. <laughs> the state police didn't put that into the uh, the police report of the accident. And there was one man also in that part of the country who, for whatever reason, thought it would be funny to dress up in a Bigfoot costume and scare motorists. And what happened, he wound up getting, <laughs> he wound up getting hit by a young girl who was driving the car. And he was staggering around the highway and another girl came driving and saw Bigfoot on the... And she hit him as well and wound up killing him. So... Oh. Uh, I mean, it's not funny to him, but it's <laughs> you have to realize that uh, the shallow end of the gene pool has uh, has too many people in it. That's very. That's a good point. What? <laughs> it's absolute ridiculous nonsense, too, that somebody would do that. But so I take it you you don't believe in Bigfoot. I don't know what to believe, and that was the funny thing because I came to the book and I, with an objective uh, opinion. I said. I grew up watching this stuff, but this was back in an era when there were films about UFOs, uh, yeah. the Bermuda Triangle, I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, uh, Loch Ness Monster, the abominable yeah. snowman in the Himalayas. So uh, it was part of the, the culture. It, it wasn't a question of whether you believed or didn't believe, it was just there. Uh, today, because it were a lot more cynical and uh, we think ourselves being more sophisticated than maybe we're not, uh, everybody has an opinion on something, and yeah. I wanted to leave the book without my opinion in it and just let the reader decide for himself or herself, is this lunacy, is this uh, a serious scientific phenomenon that needs to be explored further? And I also point out, too, that uh, the Bigfoot that was in the film was never seen again. We don't know what happened to it. Did it go off into the woods uh, to join the other Bigfoots living in California? Uh, was he got dressed up in human clothing and uh, he got dressed up in human clothing and got a job. Yeah. <laughs> what was the last of the species or, or was it just somebody in a, in a suit? We don't know at this yeah. point. And I'd like to leave it at that as opposed to saying one thing or the other. Let the reader decide uh, whether or not this is a hoax or whether this is reality. But you give them ample information to make that oh, yes. decision. Okay. Yes. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't play favorites about it. Awesome. And this is, you said this is your eighth book, correct? That is correct. Yes. So, what is it? What do the other books uh, entail? Are they more in the line of this, or are no, they no? This is actually interesting. This is the first book I've done, which is specific to one movie. My book prior to that was called *In Search of Lost Films*, and that was a very sad book to put together because this is about films that don't exist anymore. There are no prints of the films; the negatives are gone. All we have are just maybe still photographs and newspaper clippings, and. 
this goes back to the very beginning of uh, filmmaking in the 1890s, and it even goes as late as the 1970s, where there are films that were made then that have just vanished. And that uh, took me a long time to research, uh, and I was actually a year behind schedule on delivering it to the publisher because the, the research was much, much deeper than I anticipated. And it was a depressing subject, too, because I'm writing about uh, creative work that has vanished, uh, either through willful destruction, neglect, or by accident. You So with that, too, I mean, of course, it had to be difficult because it's like lost work. But how did you go about finding that? Was it first-person accounts? Did you go to the people who actually made the films or try to find well, them? Or Well, a lot of those films were made many years ago, so the filmmakers right. aren't, aren't around anymore. But I had to go through uh, historic uh, books and uh, newspaper and magazine articles that were published way back when. I had interviews with experts on the films and the filmmakers. I reached out to archives here in the U.S. and overseas to make sure films uh, were indeed lost. I didn't want to say a film was lost when it, indeed, when it wasn't. Right. And it, it was a challenge because how do you describe a film that nobody can see? And I did the best that I could and the reaction to it was uh, was very very strong. It was actually uh, of the books that I've written, that was probably my favorite to date. Wow. Okay. Now you've worked. Um, you're not just a writer. You're also an actor. Uh, you work behind the camera as well as a director. Is that right? No, not as a director. I've I've uh, worked actually in uh, marketing and publicity for ten years. I ran a public relations and marketing agency out of New York City, and a lot of my clients were independent film distributors and so I was responsible for getting their films into uh, newspapers and magazines and getting interviews with the filmmakers and the actors on television and radio and also the internet. So uh, I was involved in that aspect of the film world. I also did work in distribution. I helped some of my clients pick up films that they were able to put into theatrical and home video release. Uh, I got into acting sort of in a roundabout way. I was uh, a film critic for a website called Film Threat, and I had reviewed several independent films, and the filmmakers uh, were so appreciative of my reviews that they invited me to be in their movies, initially just in small roles. And to their surprise, and quite frankly to mine, uh, we discovered that I, I could act. And so, uh, <laughs> starting in 2005 with a movie called Land of College Profits, uh, I've been in about 20 movies to date. Wow. That's exciting, man. Like that's, uh, I mean, you just kind of fall into something. Like, obviously, your writing was either really good, or I, or maybe that you were being so critical of the, these people's films. They were like, let's just put them in it. So no, no, being... no. <laughs> I didn't get cast by people who I gave bad reviews to. These were good okay. reviews. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Yeah. It'd be a good way to, you know, <laughs> like curve it a little bit. Yeah. That's awesome. So, okay, because I was under the impression that you started out as a um, in film and then went to writing. So writing has always been a passion for you then. Oh, yeah, I was writing for about uh, 20 years before I got into film. I have to, I, in case, I'm 54 years old, so uh, I started in writing when I was in college. I was uh, 19 when I was first published professionally. Wow. Are you still with, are you still with the same publishing company? I know you're with a... A publisher now, correct? Uh, Bear Mountain Media is the book publisher that I uh, puts out my books. My film writing, I'm on the Cinema Crazed website, and I also write for Video Librarian magazine. But I've also written in the past for the New York Times, New York Daily News, Wired magazine, uh, American Movie Classics magazine when that was being published. I've written for the Hartford Current about uh, film as well. Uh, that's actually one aspect of my career. I've also been a business journalist for the past three decades as well. I've edited financial magazines and real estate finance magazines, and I write about small business and technology and uh, science and medicine. So uh, wow. I get around, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, and this, that's, a, that's an awesome because I talk to a lot of indie authors, a lot of indie, in, independently published authors, um, are people who are on the cusp of like sending out query letters, trying to find the publishers. Um, how did it all start for you? Like, what what was your um, gateway into it? Did you was it a lot of rejection letters, or was it like just oh, here's, yes. my, here's my book, I'm the best in the world kind of deal? Well, the uh, as a 
freelance writer doing magazine and newspaper articles, there were a lot of rejections over the years, and that goes with the territory. Yeah. With the books, I was lucky. Uh, my first book, I wasn't even looking to be a book writer. Uh, this was back in 2003, and a company called Michael Weesey Publications um, had a contract with my film thread editor. His name was Chris Gore to do a book about underground movies, and Chris was not able to uh, complete the project because of some other work he was doing. So he contacted me and saying, how would you like to take over my contract and write this book? Which I did. And it was published in 2004 under the title, The Encyclopedia of Underground Movies. And I published another book with Michael Weesey uh, called Independent Film Distribution, which was about how independent filmmakers would be able to get their movies into theatrical and home entertainment release. Uh, that was published in 2005. Unfortunately, those two books are no longer in print and probably better for that because uh, they would need to be updated uh, yeah. exactly because they were published, what is that, 14, 15 years ago. So uh, it's it's really quite outdated, if especially uh, independent film distribution because the distribution patterns have changed so dramatically. When I was writing that book in 2005, there was no Netflix, uh, there was no Amazon Prime. Uh, people were still using MySpace to promote their films. I don't know if you're, you're uh, old enough to remember. I remember MySpace, yeah. <laughs> I had a page. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people were using it for film promotion. Uh, I, I, don't, I know the site's still online. I have no idea who uses it or why it would be used. <laughs> yeah, what are they doing on there? That's interesting. Um, so, like, what kind of advice would you give somebody who's first? Because it's changed, I suppose, a, a good bit, like you just said, um, getting into the writing game now but what would you what kind of advice would you give somebody starting out um on the, in their writing career starting out i would give two pieces of advice the first piece is uh be persistent because you're going to get a lot of rejections and don't take it personally because it goes with the territory just because you have an idea that you think is good for a newspaper or a magazine or website doesn't mean that everyone's going to share the opinion the yeah. second advice and this is something that some people may not uh, realize, particularly in today's age where everybody sends out nasty tweets and uh, sarcastic <laughs> Facebook posts. Don't, don't piss people off. Be pleasant. Yeah. Don't make enemies because you think, oh, it's, uh, writing is, is this big industry. Uh, word gets around if somebody is difficult or nasty or uh, incompetent, and you'd be surprised. So. Don't make it. Yes. If, if you get a rejection, just uh, e either acknowledge it uh, with, a, with a thank you for le taking the time to read my work or don't say anything. But don't be a, a smart aleck. Don't uh, don't go sharing on social media. Hey, uh, this newspaper uh, didn't like my proposal, didn't like my article. What a bunch of jerks they are. They'll <laughs> say it and it'll come back to bite you. Trust me. Yeah, it's interesting when I see people do that kind of thing. It just it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think those. I mean, it's like you said about the gene pool earlier. I mean, it's kind of you know, it's working itself out. Um, <laughs> natural selection in a way. Uh, so what are you working on now? I'm now on book number nine, and that's called Jesus Christ Movie Star. And the book <laughs> is about how uh, the motion picture world has depicted Jesus from. The 1890s, when movies were first uh, beginning, up yeah. to today with the uh, the new um, Mel Gibson uh, film, which is the sequel to Passion of the Christ that he's shooting now. So hopefully that'll be out sometime next year. And I'm doing research and I'm sitting through a lot of Jesus movies. Uh, I can't really believe the, the variety of it is just astonishing from uh, the very beginning where... Uh, the films only ran about 10 minutes and were silent in black and white up to uh, through the 1970s where, believe it or not, I didn't realize this, but 1973, there were actually three different musicals based on the Gospels. I mean, I knew about the uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, which is where the, my book sort of gets its title from, as well as Godspell. But Johnny Cash did a, a musical film called The Gospel Road that came out that year, and I had never seen it until recently. And this was just a really an eye-opening discovery because it's just so very, very different from anything else that had come before it. Wow, I can't imagine. I mean, I like a good movie and stuff like that, and watching movies about Jesus is cool. But how many movies have you seen now? Um, <laughs> I've lost count, and I still have uh, 
an infinite number to go through, too, because I'm going back and forth through the the decades. I've been watching films that have been made recently, then watching films from the 40s and 50s, then back to the silent era, then back to today. And I don't want to go chronologically. I just want, uh, for me, it's more interesting just to go time hopping to see how the different generations approach the subject. So you're you're obviously um, in love with film as well. I mean, that's where you've drawn the majority of your inspiration from uh, with your writing. What do you what do you see as like the biggest jump forward in film? Obviously, the inclusion of sound was huge. Oh, <laughs> that helps. Yeah. <laughs> that helped. But yeah. like into this new generation of film, do you see anything that's like this is going to be the next big thing coming up, or do you have yeah. any insight there? Or? It's funny because when uh, movies were first introduced in the 1890s, Thomas Edison uh, created a machine called uh, the kinetoscope. And what it was, it was basically a cabinet with a window and only one person at a time could look into it to watch a, a loop of film go through. And it wasn't a commercial success. And so that's why we have movies on the screen so you could have a communal experience. Today, the technology has uh, changed the point that we're back to almost Edison's day where we're watching movies on our cell phone. Yeah. Looking at a, uh, the screen is about the size of the window of the kinetoscope. So we have actually gone back to the 1890s in a way. So movies aren't a communal experience anymore. It's just one person squinting into a tiny screen. But instead of watching just a 60-second loop, we're watching two-hour movies of, of Will Smith fighting aliens or whatever you, you care to watch it. And that's really not the way movies were supposed to be enjoyed because filmmakers are creating films, at least they were, to be seen on the big screen uh, yeah. by an audience. They weren't meant bad enough that you're watching it on television, which is a, a shrunken screen. Even if, and if it's uh, panned and, obviously it used to be panned and scanned, uh, back in the day in the 60s and 70s when films were on TV. So if you had a widescreen movie, uh, the camera would be going back and forth. Only one third of the screen could, uh, the movie screen image was could fit on the TV. Now, of course, we have letterboxed, so you're yeah. able to keep the dimensions. But the problem with that is you're, you're losing about one third of the screen. So you're still squinting, looking at uh, a movie on a TV screen, which is not uh, the way it was supposed to be seen. And it's even worse looking at it on, a, uh, on an iPhone, and especially if it's going to be a foreign film with subtitles, so you'd have to try to read these itty bitty letters on the iPhone. So in many ways, movie technology is, uh, instead of going ahead, has gone way, it's gone even further back to where it was from the beginning. Do you think it's like a rubber band effect? I mean, it's being pulled back and it's gonna leap forward? Because I, I know like there's, if you know, VR, they have these things where you can like hook your phone into the VR or whatever, and you can actually like feel like you're sitting in a movie theater watching on a big screen, even though you're watching on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, it's a crazy, it's it's insane how it, your senses it tricks your senses, but it's really neat too. Um, do, you, but, do you think? Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, you know, movies should be enjoyed with people. That's why I never got into VR because VR is just you put the goggles on your head and you're immersed in it. Yeah. So some of the, the most wonderful memories I have related to movies are being in theaters with an audience reacting as a whole to what we see. I remember uh, when I saw Animal House in the theater when it had come out oh. at the end of the, the movie when they, uh, Belushi and the, the Playboy Bunny were driving off and it freezes and it says Senator and Mrs. Uh, John Blutarski. The whole audience burst into applause and this was a, in a huge theater in New York City. And you can't get an experience like that just uh, sitting by yourself looking at the iPhone or having the VR goggles on. I remember seeing Young Frankenstein for the first time when it came out in 1974. I actually sat through the movie twice. It was the only time I ever did that where the film was over. And was, I just, I want to see this again. It was that good. And being with an audience full of people and laughing at something which is brand new. I remember also seeing uh, the film The Crying Game when it opened uh, in 1992, I think it was, in New York when there was the plot twist in the movie and the entire audience gasped as one and then just started laughing because they realized they had been had. And it's it's that's the beauty of, of seeing a movie with people. Even if you're sitting with friends watching a movie, I mean, I've, I've sat with friends watching uh, Tommy Wiseau's hilarious oh, yeah. film The Room 
and oh, people yeah. are laughing and they're talking with the at, back at the film. Movies should be enjoyed with people. I mean, you people do see them by themselves, whether they're at home in their living room or watching, uh, I don't know, on a laptop if they're on a, a plane or a train ride. But that's not that's not the best way to enjoy a movie. If you if you can't share it with somebody, uh, you're you're really missing half the fun. You know, that's I never even thought about it like that, but the community aspect of watching a film in a movie theater, it's like having a having a shared shared experience because when you're around other people, for whatever reason, just the, the way you react to things is heightened, right? Because it's like if something is supposed to be scary, it's scarier around other people because you feel like you're supposed to like react to it. I never even thought of it. that's that's neat to And it does it doesn't have to be a movie theater either. I used to years ago I used to program a movie series at a place called the Siberia Bar in New York City. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. It was a dive bar that had a, a stage set up for entertainment, and they had yeah. a, a video projector and a screen. And I had uh, I was programming the films there every week. And one week, I showed uh, the old Japanese monster movie, Destroy All Monsters. It was made in 1968 with Godzilla. Yeah. And it's a scene in the film where apparently the aliens from come down from outer space and they're taking over the planet by controlling the world's monsters. And there's one scene where the general gets a phone call saying Godzilla has landed in New York. And there you see next shot is Godzilla standing in what's supposed to be the East River. And he looks at the United Nations and just breathes uh, that atomic Green fire man. breath of his and blows up the building. And everybody in the bar who was watching it just went, yay! And they burst into <laughs> <laughs> because Godzilla was in our town, and he was uh, he was doing to the UN what so many of us wanted to do. So, and, and, and it's an, I can just I'm thinking about it now. I'm smiling now, and just so happy to remember because I was able to just share that hilarious moment with uh, with so many people. And it was a bar; it wasn't even a movie theater. But we were all together watching it and having a great time. So, what were some of the um, movies as a kid growing up that were like? mind blow something that transformed your life and was like i gotta get into i gotta even i, I want to talk about and be yeah. about movies for the rest of my life was there uh, a yes there are a lot of films the um when i was a kid i wanted to be an animator and i used to i loved the bugs bunny cartoons when i was a kid then i saw the beatles cartoon yellow submarine which was very very different looking from uh, the Warner Brothers or Disney cartoons, and I couldn't believe that this type of stuff could be done in animation. So I started reading about how that was made and how other animated films were made. So uh, those films had a big impact on me. I also discovered silent movies as a kid. I was kind of lucky in that sense. There was a, a show on our local PBS station called Silent Comedy Film Festival, and they showed Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton on uh, these were living cartoons. These, these were people that were throwing bricks at each other and, and kicking each other <laughs> in the rear and, and having these wild chases. And I learned to love that. And then I got into dramatic silent films as well, which unfortunately a lot of kids today don't uh, get to experience. And just over time discovering uh, movies. I was also lucky growing up in New York. We had a Channel 9, which was a, an independent station. And they showed classic European films. These films were dubbed into English, but uh, it didn't matter to me as a kid. I wasn't that picky about the quality of the lip syncing and the, the dubbing, but I got to see uh, classic films like Man and a Woman and Sunflower uh, that I would never have been able to see. So uh, over time, there's just so many, I could just keep talking and talking, but uh, I, I <laughs> could be here till morning uh, doing that. It's incredible the passion that you. I can see the passion that you have for the film film industry, for movies, for entertainment. I mean, it's it's incredible, and you've lived an entire life, you know, going after that and doing it, writing about it, talking about it, now being in films, and you're also you're doing a, a radio show, correct? Well, yes, and it's a podcast. You could call podcast. it a radio show. <clears throat> it's called the Online Movie Show. It's on SoundCloud, and uh, it's a weekly show. I interview. Uh, filmmakers, actors, uh, film historians who've written books about classic movies and great actors. And we've done about 90, 92 episodes so far. We're coming up on our 100th. It's been on for three seasons. And it's, it's a lot of fun to, uh, to talk about that. You know, movies are a type of subject. It's a subject I think everybody can agree upon because not everyone can talk about music because there are generational differences. I mean, I... 
I wouldn't know Ariana Grande if I fell over her, to be honest, but uh, people who are in their 20s wouldn't know the music that I grew up with. Likewise right. with sports, not everybody is a sports fanatic, and I, I've learned not to talk about politics for obvious reasons today. But talking about movies, uh, that's something everyone can talk about, uh, even if uh, something that's playing in the theater now or something that may have been on Turner Classic Movies or... Uh, even if you're just talking about like Tommy Wiseau's film, The Room, if anyone who's seen this, I mean, has an opinion of it. And, you know, the, one of the funniest conversations I've had was about a discussion of horror movies. And it's interesting because whenever people talk about horror movies, they're smiling and laughing. People are like, oh, my God, I was scared to death. No, they, they love the idea that, that they were they were frightened out of uh their wits by watching whatever uh, creatures or slashes or whatever were on the screen. And it, the movies, I think, are the common ground for everybody to to speak about. Wow, yeah. And then, and you've been doing it for, you said, three seasons now. Yes. Um, what a... I'm going to ask you this because I had this question asked to me. Who's, your, who's been your favorite interview so far? Oh, I don't... <laughs> Somebody asked me that and I was like, you... <laughs> uh, they're, I, they're all great. I, I can tell you the only time I was genuinely starstruck, um, I had Karen Allen as a guest, and she was in Animal House, which I just mentioned earlier, and she was in Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it was a pleasure to speak with her and uh, learn about her career. She had worked with Paul Newman on the film version of The Class Menagerie, and I was going, to, I was ready to ask her about that, and she just started talking about that, which was a nice surprise to me. And she was a very pleasant, very lovely person. Uh, to speak with. So uh, if that would be a first among equals, I'd probably give it to Karen Allen. Okay, awesome. Now, you uh, you obviously have a lot of connections. How did you go about getting, I know when you, you said you got into acting by a chance of writing as a critic, but did you go about getting a um, literary literary agent or do you have an agent now for that no. handles both things or is that all you? It's all me. I don't have uh, an agent. I've, I've been approached by people who wanted to represent me, but I don't really need it because I have a steady publisher. I have a very good relation with Bear Mana Media. Uh, my work is being published by Cinema Crazed and Video Librarian, and uh, I've dealt directly with the publishers of both of those sites. So I, I've not needed an agent. I'm not going to tell people don't get an agent because... Right. If you're going for certain types of nonfiction or if you're going into fiction or even maybe poetry, that might help. But my situation is distinctive to me. And in my case, I've been able to get this far without having an agent. Well, I mean, it seems it seems kind of par for the course for you. You've talked so much about community, about how watching movies is a community thing. And you're, you've built a community around yourself with, you know, just by your passion of film and writing. That you, I feel like you don't really need one because you've had such a network of people because of that idea of community. Um, how long have you been on the Twitter Twitter uh, writing community atmosphere? Oh, I don't. I've been on Twitter. Uh, I started on Twitter actually not for my writing, but uh, for a business publication that I was the editor of, and this would have been going back. Oh, jeez, this would have been about like 2007, 2008. In fact, our office uh, was not on social media at the time. And this yeah. was, I was the editor of a real estate finance magazine. And I said, you know, we, we should be on Twitter. And I created the account uh, for us and started tweeting out and actually helped to drive uh, readership for our online news. So, uh, but that was where I got into Twitter. Uh, I was actually, when I was doing public relations work, this is interesting because back in the 1990s, I had worked for an agency in New York City, and one of our clients was uh, an online site called Prodigy. I don't know if you remember them or if you've heard of them. Uh, they were they were sort of the forerunner of uh, a lot of what's going on in the internet. There were three companies at the time. There was Prodigy, America Online, which AOL, and yeah. CompuServe. And Prodigy uh, was founded by the combined forces of IBM and Discover, the credit card people. Okay. And I remember back then that they wanted to get a bank involved as uh, for obvious reasons for to help finance the venture. And nobody wanted to get into it because in 1993, the whole idea is uh, what's the internet? Who, who would want to be looking at a computer all day? What is this all about? And when I was, uh, when I started my own public relations agency, which was 1994, I had a lot of 
technology clients, and a lot of them were selling software off the internet. Yeah. And I, every day, it seemed like every day, I would try to explain to magazine editors and to writers that you don't need to go to a store to buy a piece of software. You can actually go to a website and it would download right to your computer. I mean, today it's, it's sort of like yeah. telling people how to turn a faucet on and off, but back in 1996, it was such an alien concept that I actually had to take the time and explain. And these are the editors of computer magazines too, and they didn't get it. <laughs> it's amazing what has happened in 20 years, right? Just like the... Astonishing, yeah, it is. It, it's just, and actually it's, I, I don't want to come across like a bracket, but it's, it's one of the accomplishments I am proudest of is the fact that you're watching new movies on the internet today in many ways, you have me to thank for it because back in 1998, I was doing public relations for an online site called The Sync, spelled S-Y-N-C, so short for, short for synchronization. Wow. And they were they had a couple of old silent films and some amateur short movies on their site. And I said to them, you know, it, maybe it would help if we could get a contemporary film to put up there because I don't know of any contemporary film on the internet. This is 1998. Now, back then, the Hollywood studios would not touch the internet because they were afraid of piracy, and rightfully yeah. so. And also, the quality of the internet was uh, not as good as it is today. A lot of people were still on dial-up, so pictures, the, the screen pictures would have been pixelated. Now, as luck would have it, I knew a filmmaker out of San Francisco named Erica Jordan, who had created a black-and-white feature film called Walls of Sand, which played in film festivals but was never theatrically released and wasn't on home video. Mm -hmm. And I contacted her and I said, Erica, how would you like to make history? And I introduced her to the owners of the sink and they all agreed to put Walls of Sand on the sink. And Walls of Sand was the first contemporary feature film to be screened in real time on the internet. Anyone could go to the sink website and watch wow. the movie. So the fact if you wanted today to go on to see, go to YouTube and watch whatever movie, uh, is there, whether it's any new movie that's out, or even watching stuff on Netflix today, the fact you're watching on a computer screen, that's traced all the way back to Walls of Sand, and I was uh, the linchpin for making that happen. Dude, that's freaking cool, man. Yeah. That's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. Thank, it's, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you didn't know it at the time, though, right? Or was, was this like a forethought, <laughs> like, wait a second? No. Did you I knew it at the time, and that was it. In fact, you can even look, if you look online, you can find a New York Times article which cited Walls of Sand as being the first contemporary feature film to be on the internet. They interviewed Erica Jordan and the people. No, I mean, did you sink. know it would be that big? Like, did you know it was going to. Yes, I knew it was going to. It had to happen sooner or later because the same thing happened with home video. Yeah. Because when home video was introduced uh, to the mass market in the 1970s, a lot of the studios didn't want their films. On home video because they were afraid that they would be pirated. In fact, a lot of the first films that were made available on home video uh, were pornographic films because the filmmakers had nothing to lose, so they, they wanted to reach a large audience. And when the Hollywood saw what the pornographers were up to and they were making money, they were like, oh, if they can do it, so can I. Right. <laughs> yeah. So keep the shot. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, so um, in terms of like publicizing all your work. I, I know you're working with publishers and that kind of thing. How else have you found about getting your work out there? Getting Because I know with a lot of indie authors, a lot of authors, just getting eyes on their work, getting eyes on what they're doing. How do you go about that? Is that something you attack regularly or is that something your publishers do for no, you? No, 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 I do that because I'm, as I said, I used to run a public relations agency, so that's second nature to me. And uh, you have to know who your audience is and how to reach the audience. So if I have a book about Bigfoot, I'm not going to be reaching, uh, say, a romantic uh, literary magazine or website because unless you're in love with Bigfoot, that's the wrong audience for it. So you, ha you have to know who... <laughs> I'd like to read that book. <laughs> I, I'd like to write it. But you have to know uh, who you're reaching. And you have to uh, establish relationships with them and get in touch with them uh, knowing their schedule too. Because if you're dealing with, say, a magazine that you, you would get in a, at a bookstore, uh, a lot of the magazines that are published, they have longer lead times. And so if you have a book that's going to be coming out uh, 
say in July, you may want to start to uh, touch base with the magazine now. We're recording this in February uh, to yeah. let them know the books come be coming out. What kind? And I would basically, if you're doing it yourself, feel free to ask. What is your timeline? When would you need materials by? Uh, do you need a, a picture of the cover? Do you need a synopsis? Would you accept an uncorrected proof so you can get an idea of what's going on? And just reach out to that. We have uh, the online media. Uh, the turnaround time is sometimes is usually much faster than that. You could uh, get in touch with them. They'll get back to you and do an interview. Sometimes they're backlogged with, with books. And so you have to be patient. That goes back to what I said earlier about being pleasant because you're dealing with uh, people uh, who are editors and publishers, and they're getting tons of inquiries from both authors as well as authors, publicists. And uh, not surprisingly, sometimes they can be a bit cranky and, and seem a little distracted. So yeah. uh, don't lose your temper because these people aren't uh, saying, wow, you're the greatest thing to come along in ages. I, I need you in my magazine. If only they knew me. No, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've, all right, so this may be a dumb question, but how do you, because I haven't been able to figure this out myself, and maybe I just haven't looked hard enough, but how do you go about finding the right people to contact? Oh, it's, uh, that's not a dumb question at all. Uh, you look at, you contact, if you're on a website, just go to the contact or about us page, and they usually list the, uh, the editors, and they would have either an email address or a phone number. If it's not there, and if there's just a contact like info at publication.com, just send an email saying, who do I send this to? Or if there's a, even better, a phone number, uh, call them up and ask them. It's usually, you get a lot more done, I find, sometimes by phone than email. Yeah, Maybe yeah. because people aren't expecting phone calls anymore. But... Uh, I think it's probably true, yeah. yeah. If you don't know, ask, because that's the only way you're going to find out. And that's where, uh, when I started in my career way, way back, I just made uh, phone calls uh, saying, who do I send my material to? And people were always very nice about it, saying, send it here, uh, address it to this person. Or if they're not taking uh, submissions, they would be polite to me, saying we're not accepting submissions at this time, and uh, just move on to the next publication. Hmm. It sounds so, see, when you said it, it sounds so simple, like, oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> so that's why it is simple. It is. I mean, that's why I've been doing it because I'm not going to uh, take a difficult job. I mean, if I, right. I I'm, I'm not a rocket scientist or a neurosurgeon. I'm I'm just a writer. That's right. I know. And you talk about uh, just ask if you don't know, man. Things I don't know. <laughs> I could write a book about it. It'd be a very short book. Um, the next, the last thing I wanted to ask, and um, well, second to last thing I want to ask because I I feel silly if I didn't ask this. As somebody who's um aspiring and acting and that kind of thing as well what would be your advice to to that person to me <laughs> me, me specifically you specifically <laughs> yes. well um you're in the atlanta, you're in the atlanta area aren't you i am yeah so basically um unless you're planning to move to hollywood or new york i would concentrate on whatever film and tv productions going on down there i don't know the atlanta scene uh, off the top of my head but i would uh, start looking about on various sites, even something as elementary as Craigslist to see in their TV film video section what's being shot down there. Uh, if you're getting want to get a foot in the door and you don't mind working for free just to have some credits, uh, see about getting in touch with whatever local productions are going on, uh, whether it's film video, I don't know if you're interested in theater to do that just so you could have something on a resume saying I've done these acting roles. Or you could also just uh, grab a video camera or grab your cell phone and see about uh, shooting your own little movie. So uh, you, you can create your own credits and uh, put the films up on on YouTube or Vimeo. So there are several okay. ways to uh, to get a foot in the door. I was actually thinking about doing that and making my own. I've been writing uh, stuff to like do scenes and stuff like that. I've been reading other people's books, doing dramatic readings at night, but because I, I wanted to get into that. But, you know, Woody Harrelson is down here because they're shooting the second um, Zombieland movie. Some friends of mine were playing soccer with them at Piedmont Park yesterday. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Atlanta is huge for the for the market, and apparently I'm right in the, the area where they're shooting a lot of movies. But I, th I guess it's more of just like I've never had my foot in the door, so even, even thinking about putting it, wedging it somewhere there, 
is kind of daunting. It is, there are also websites that have um, auditions that are available for around the country in different markets as well. So just do research. If you just go on to uh, Google, just write Atlanta film acting jobs, see what comes up. That's a great idea. When in doubt, Google, when in doubt, Google it, man. Google, yeah. <laughs> Google it. All right, so this is the last question. Um, I ask everybody about their legacy. Uh, when it comes to Phil Hall, what what is Phil Hall's legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? Um, you know, when you're gone from when you're gone from this place, and all that's left is the things you've written and the things you've done. What do you hope that people get from that? Oh, I <laughs> I hope I have a few more years before that happens. Oh yeah. Um, I I don't know. I mean, people will whether they find me or whether uh, my work slips away, I have no control over that. That's one of the things I've learned as a writer, also as an actor, is you have no control on how people react to your work. I mean, I've done, I've written stuff that I consider to be not special and I've gotten praise for it and I've written work which I'm very proud of and nobody shares my pride in. Uh, <laughs> I've done acting that uh, I thought was just uh, cringeworthy and I've, uh, I've won award for that. <laughs> <So> <clears throat> you don't know how people are going to think and uh, hopefully my books will still be in print and the articles that I have online will remain online because just because something's on the internet doesn't mean it's going to be there forever and uh, if somebody reads my work and learns something or gets a laugh out of it an intentional laugh uh, then I probably did okay awesome yeah it was, it's uh that objective look of, at art, right? It's the, I, I guess it's just the, a life of art, really, because everyone's going to see it differently. It is scary to think that somebody's going to look at it and dislike it. But what was the what was the cringeworthy performance? What was the movie? That you saw? <laughs> I'm not going to get into that because the filmmaker okay. will be watching, and uh, oh, okay. I don't think <laughs> okay. uh, if I want to be in his next movie, so I'm not going to them off. Yeah, I got you. Well. Uh, Phil, I thank you so much for your time uh, joining me on the Uniweb interview show. Uh, it was a pleasure getting to know you. I uh, hope that we can stay in touch. Definitely. Feel free to get in touch with me and your viewers, too, if you want to reach out to me. I'm on uh, Facebook. Just look for Phil Halls, somebody who looks like me, and uh, feel free <laughs> to uh, send a, a direct message to me. Uh, or you can contact me through uh Cinema Crazed or Video Librarian or through my book publisher, Bear Mana Media. Awesome. And yeah, I'm going to put all your uh, contact information, all your uh, your book information and the links to this video as well. So um, I thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a wonderful night. You too. Take care. Thanks, Phil. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you would, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification for the bell. You know what? We love you. Love you. Love you. You know what? Oh!